Uh, gracious Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that we can come together to look into what another religion believes. We're going to be looking this morning at uh, Judaism. Uh, Father, I pray that you would help us to understand these things. There's still things in it that I'm, I'm still uh, not completely understanding, but uh, there's so much in it, so many different uh, rabbinical books and things that um, <clears throat> we can read and learn from that have different views. Uh, just like we see within Christianity at times, there are different sects that have different views within it. And so, Father, we just pray that you would give us the grace, give us the uh, mercy to understand and give us the wisdom, the knowledge, the ears to hear today, uh, that we might learn some new things that we, will be uh, beneficial for us as we go out and share the gospel and maybe come in contact with people of this religion, that uh, we can point them to the truth, but because we would have a better understanding of what they actually believe and, and not misrepresent them uh, in any way um, <clears throat> in the attempts to... <clears throat> excuse me, then to prove our, our faith, which we know is true. We know that you are the truth, uh, the way and the life. And so uh, we, we pray that uh, this would be beneficial to us and that it would help us, Lord, and you would use it to help us to grow in our understanding. Father, I pray for our church. I pray that uh, you would be with us this, uh, this whole entire time that we've come to gather together to worship you, to praise you, uh, that you would help grow us and sanctify us and bring us into more uh, holiness, Lord, and walking rightly with you. Uh, Father, we, we ask that you would do that among us because uh, it is only by your grace that we grow. It is only by your grace that we become more sanctified. And so we ask that, Lord. We want to be uh, more and more like your son, Jesus Christ, each and every day of our lives. And so we pray that uh, the things that we do here, uh, that they're being uh, glorifying to you and being used to do that. Pray for Elisa, Lord, uh, that you would be with her as she's not feeling well. Uh, help her to uh, overcome that, feel better as well, Lord, as the, you know, being with us this afternoon as we go back out to share the gospel uh, and pass out tracts and just talk to people uh, as you allow. And we pray that you would go before us, uh, that we would, um, that the hearts of those that we talk to would be receptive and would be uh, able to hear. And, and Father, we pray, we ask, you know, even if we don't see fruit, Lord, we, we know that we are called to be faithful. Um, but we ask to see fruit. We ask to see people saved. We ask to see people engaged that we might be able to become, uh, that they might be able to come become discipled by us. Um, <clears throat> not for the benefit of wanting to see our numbers grow, although we do want to see that, Lord, but uh, just to see people come to understand who you are and come to saving faith and grow in their knowledge of who you are as well. So, Father, we ask that you would bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> All right. Uh, Real quick um, review, uh, really quick, we started an introduction last week of what we're going to be getting into. This is uh, a study of Western religions. This material is from Striving for Eternity, from Andrew Rappaport put this stuff together, uh, and we're basically going through this book uh, that he has <coughs> for this study. <coughs> Excuse me. We've been preaching all weekend, so my voice is a little raspy, um, but we're going through this study and we're going to be talking about Judaism today. And so hopefully, again, like I said, this will help us understand a little bit more about what they actually believe uh, to help us. Then when we um, engage with someone who holds to this faith, it can better prepare us to know uh, for sure what they believe. And even as I said, there are still different sects of things, just like within Christianity, you have different sects of of believers that may be holding to the truth of what they teach and believe, uh, the orthodox of that, but may have some differences. So we see that within all religions everywhere. You know, we, we, we see that same type of, of uh, differences. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so what is the authority in Judaism? Okay, the authority in Judaism, it has four major sources. Uh, that of these authorities that are accepted today. You have the Tanakh, the Mishnah, the Midrash, and the Talmud. Okay. Now, I've heard of the Talmud before and the Tanakh, uh, but so, these other two were kind of new to me in looking at this, um, and we're going to talk a little about, about each one of them. But it's interesting, you know, uh, these are their sources that they have uh, that are accepted today. Um, and it's still, like I was just telling Pastor this morning, I've, I've looked through this stuff, I was looking at it again last night, and I still get confused as to which one is which. 
because it's just it's really new to me. Judaism is a new thing to me. I've talked to Jewish people out on the streets, shared the gospel with them. I always stick with what I know in Christianity and going back to to Christ and wanting pointing them to Christ. But uh, hopefully this will be helpful for uh, it's helpful for me and hopefully you as well to kind of learn some of these different sources that they have. <clears throat> So the Tanakh is the Hebrew Bible containing 24 books. All right, it is the Christians' Old Testament with some combined, or that are combined into one. So like we have First and Second Samuel, it would just be Samuel, the book of Samuel. First and Second Corinthians, just the book of Corinthians. I mean, not Corinthians, Chronicles. Right. Uh, so you know they would have these combined into one. All right, to make it, and they've got 24 uh, books there. It is referred to as the written law. And the belief is that God dictated the Bible to the writers word for word. Uh, there is a threefold division in the Tanakh, the Torah, and the prophets. The, in the Tanakh, the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. Um, the Torah, which maybe we've heard of that as well, it means law. Okay? In general, the Torah can refer to both the oral and written law or the whole of the Tanakh. However, the Torah is more specifically refers to the Pentateuch, uh, which is the first five books of the Bible. You know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Um, <clears throat> uh, Judaism teaches that every letter in the Torah is identical to that which was given to Moses on Mount Sinai, and it is complete. Uh, the creation of the Torah is believed to have preceded creation. Which is still a little. There, there's a lot of mysticism in Judaism, Judaism, but uh, they believe that this preceded creation. So the Torah preceded it. Now, I mean, God is God. His word is never changing. <clears throat> His word is always true. His characteristics and everything is always true throughout all of time. Uh, they don't change. Uh, but they believe that the Torah preceded creation. They say uh, seven things were created before the world was created, the Torah, uh, repentance, the Garden of Eden, paradise, uh, Gehenna, the throne of glory, the temple, and the name of the Messiah. And as I was talking with Austin again earlier, um, in the book that we have, he gives us these references, um, and they're like abbreviated, this PES uh, 54A, but he doesn't give the actual where it's coming from. So I was trying to find these. Uh, it, it's interesting. You just type in like PES period because you don't know what you're thinking. And then the number and the A and like all these different things come up. Some of it had nothing to do with religion. And so, but I did find it for this one. Some of them I didn't find. So you'll see that throughout here to find these sources because they're not listed in the book. But this is from the Babylonian Talmud. Okay. Uh, some of the notes that he had in here is uh, Jews would see the Christians as having multiple New Testament Bibles, uh, referring to the different manuscripts. They believe that proves that the New Testament cannot be from God because of the differences in the manuscripts. And actually, as Christians, again, we'll get into the Christian area when we get further to that. And we've talked about some of the things when it comes to uh, how we got the Bible and things like that, how it was interpreted. But I think, and, and James White makes this case, the fact that we have so many different manuscripts and there may be some small minor details in it is more proof of evidence that we can trust what the Word of God says. Um, but that's one of the things that they use, and so does Islam and other things. So you got all these different manuscripts. you got all these different Bibles, you know, which is the true, true one. Um, so although the Torah was created before creation, there is debate over how long <clears throat> before. According to one opinion, the Torah preceded creation by 2,000 years, uh, referring to Genesis 8-2. And the R in there, as I was also telling Pastor before, is it, it's, it refers to Rabbah. So whenever you see that, whenever you see a scripture verse referenced, and then the R, it's basically their commentary, the Jewish, a Jewish commentary on that book. So that's what that means when you see those. Uh, but another view is 974 generations before creation of the whole world, the Torah was written and lay in the bosom of the Holy One, blessed be He. And I saw this a lot too, this blessed be He, and it, it reminded me of... Islam, because whenever they mention a prophet's name or, you know, they're referring to God or, you know, like I said, a prophet Muhammad, they would always say, blessed be, you know, or blessed is he. Um, and so I, I looked at that and I thought, 
It's interesting, I think, because we say God's name or we use God's name so so often, I think, you know, sometimes we don't have a reverence for it. I'm not saying we have to say, blessed be he, but we, we often don't have a reverence for it. And here we have religions in the world that, you know, uh, believe in their, their gods, which uh, have false beliefs. Many of them are false gods that they believe in, but they have such a reverence for that name that, of the God that they believe, right? I just thought that was interesting. Um, so they also have these other, the other threes. You got the prophets. Uh, the prophets contain the major and the minor prophets. Uh, and then they have the hiographa. Uh, or the writings. Uh, the writings are the rest of the writings in the Old Testament Bible, like the Psalms, the Proverbs, and Samuel, etc. Now the Midrash, one of the other four um, sources that they have. Uh, the Midrash is a commentary on the Tanakh. Uh, some rabbis state that it is the system of interpretation employed throughout the rabbinic literature. Uh, hence, the, allegoric, the allegorical method of interpretation in the Midrash uh, leads to some Jewish mysticism, in which we, we, we see that a lot with Judaism. There's a lot of mysticism. Uh, there are several different Midrashes written by different rabbis. Uh, they are not assumed to be the Word of God, but they are an authoritative source <clears throat> of Judaism. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Another source is the Mishnah. The Mishnah is an abstract or summary of the religious and civil law uh, of the Jews. It is referred to as the oral law. It is believed that the oral law was given at the time, the same time in written, the written law was on Mount Sinai and was given to Moses but not written down until about 220 BCE, you know. Uh, Judaism uh, teaches that the Mishnah was the memorized concept by concept was the memorized concept by concept as opposed to word for word uh, throughout the centuries. Uh, the Mishnah was given orally from generation to generation, but not word for word. Instead, concept by concept, and we we see that with some of our translations of the Bible, when people that may use a NIV or um, <clears throat> some of these other paraphrase type Bibles. Uh, which, we, which we would not recommend to use for personal study. Uh, I, I would say use something literal, trans, you know, translation. But they're good to help you understand. They, they can be good to help you understand um, some things. But it's more of a concept for concept in a paraphrase as, as opposed to word for word. <clears throat> uh, and then the last source of the Talmud. The Talmud is the commentary on the Mishnah. Uh, the Talmud is a work wherein is is a work wherein that is developed, uh, is deposited the bulk of the literary labors uh, of numerous Jewish scholars over a period of some 700 years, roughly speaking between 200 B.C. and 500 C. Um, <clears throat> B.C. Or, yeah. Uh, there are two primary Talmuds, the Palestinian and the Babylonian. Palestinian Talmud composed shortly after 400 CE and the Babylonian Talmud referred as the Talmud uh, completed about 500. Uh, the religious leaders of each generation were empowered through the Mishnah to legislate for their own time in the light of contemporary circumstances. Uh, therefore, the Torah, both written and oral, were a running commentary on the Torah, uh, both written and oral. Uh, the Talmud is their tradition and usually seems to take precedence over the scriptures of faith and practice, which is, again, something that a lot of times when we get into religious practices, we put tradition over the scriptures themselves, you know, uh, and we're in the Christian world. They're not exempt from that. They do the same thing as there's many that do that. They put their tradition over uh, the scriptures. <clears throat> uh, the rabbinic law rabbinic law are the rules of the rabbis found in the Talmud and the Midrash uh, it is important to note that ritual keeping the message over time it is important to note that uh, keep, keep the ri they keep the rituals on the message over time uh, the message of the rituals and regain the message from the rituals 
Uh, one of the notes he had in here was, the Sadducees did not accept the rabbinical law found in the Midrash, Mishnah, or Talmud. Uh, there was a split in the Jewish leadership when the Jews returned from exile. The rabbis claimed that the oral law was given to Moses on Mount Sinai and is God's word. The Sadducees taught that there was no such law given, but that it was traditions held by the rabbis. Uh, there was political battle between the Sadducees and the Pharisees, which are the rabbis. Uh, the Sadducees had the high priest <clears throat> as the head of their group, giving them authority. Therefore, the Pharisees... Uh, come on in. Uh, therefore, the Pharisees, rabbis, had the rabbinical law, which gave them authority. Hence, the need for writing down oral law uh, for the people was necessary to give the Pharisees an authority. And we know when reading the scriptures, we see that the Pharisees and the Sadducees did not get along. You know, they had their differences. And so... <clears throat> Rick, wasn't, wasn't much of what Christ was referencing, in terms of when he was referencing their traditions that had been imposed upon the belief system back then, wasn't much of that coming from the Talmud? Or am I mistaken? I don't know if that's what he was referencing to, but I'm sure it had much to do with, I mean, because they're bringing in these traditions, as he's saying here. In terms of divorce, I know that they were... Uh, yeah, they had different... Divorce issues. Sure. In terms of other things yeah. like that, I know that... They but there was different, there was different rabbi, there was different teaching, because they'd say, well, because they would try to trick Christ, we know that, they'd come and say, well, where do you stand with this? This rabbi says this, but this rabbi says this. So you had your different traditions, different teachings. There was different uh, rabbis that they might sit under, different types of teachings. And then they may have come from some of these different, you know, schools of thought. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's highly possible, but I don't know exactly, you know, if I could say one way or the other. If it was from that. What's that? I said, I think I recall that being the case, but I don't want to be dogmatic. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, God. Their concept of God held by the rabbis is monotheistic, uh, which means they believe in one God, uh, as do we. Uh, he created in the beginning one man, uh, and this is from the Sanhedrin uh, 38. It's again, it's from some of their Jewish rabbinical writings, uh, <clears throat> both the ba Babylonian Talmud. Talmud. Uh, he created in the beginning one man only, so that heretics should not say that there are several powers in heaven. Uh, on this verse, hear, O Israel, the Lord God, the Lord is one. The comment is made, the Holy One, blessed be he, said to Israel, my children, everything that I created in the universe is in pairs. Heaven and earth, the sun and the moon, Adam and Eve, the world and the world to come. But I am the one and alone in the universe. So that's Deuteronomy. And again, it's the R's for Rabbah, which means this is their commentary on, on Deuteronomy. <clears throat> Uh, the rabbis define the Christian trinity as three gods. So many people do that. And unfortunately, even some Christians, they don't understand the trinity and they define it in many different ways. Uh, and that's one way that I've actually heard Christians even say, well, we believe in three gods. Although they may, they may be saying it the wrong way, just not correctly understanding it. Uh, but many other religions believe that we have this three gods that we believe in. <clears throat> as can be seen in their attempt to answer the Christian doctrine of God. Uh, what is that which was, is written? Let us make man in our image after our likeness in Genesis 1.26. Read what follows. It is, it is not said, and God's, created, and God's created man in their image, but God created man in his own image. Uh, in the past, Adam was created from the dust of the ground, and Eve was created from Adam. Henceforth, it is to be in our image after our likeness, meaning man, will not be able to come into existence without a woman, not women without man, uh, not both without Shekinah, you know, the Shekinah glory. And this is a rabbi. Yes? I was just going to say in terms of, because I, Judaism is not, you know, maybe you're, you know, you have a different experience than me, but in terms of the people that we relate to on the street, don't get a lot of Jewish people with you. I don't, yeah. I have, though, and the ones that I get, you better be able to defend them. And the idea with them is that they think that the Trinity comes from the New Testament and that the Old Testament does not allow for a Trinity. The Old Testament demands a Trinity. It demands uh, three persons, not necessarily three persons is crystal clear, although I think it is clear, it gets clearer in the New Testament, but multiple persons within the 
the one Godhead, and being able to know those passages from Hosea, from the Psalms that are quoted in uh, Hebrews chapter one. Really, if you memorize, or not, not, not you don't even have to memorize. Know Hebrews chapter one really, really well and know the references that presumably Paul uses to the Old Testament, you'll be able to defend it. Because they're gonna come, they're gonna come right out of the gate and they're gonna know, they're gonna be ready for Genesis chapter one and you using reference to us, you know, let us right. man in our image. They're gonna come, guns loaded, and <clears throat> right. know the, the broader. Right, and this is their way of trying to defend against that, like he's saying, you know, their way of of understanding or explaining what that us means. And, and we see that, again, with many other false religions, they have ways to interpret that us, uh, and they do it. Um, some people, some other religions will say, well, you know, it's God talking to the angels. So you let us make, you know. Uh, they'll, they'll do all kinds of things to come up with it. So, yeah, it, it's, it's good to know the references in the Old Testament because, honestly, um, again, we see it in the Old Testament. It's more clearer we see through the, the New Testament revealing things <clears throat> which are in the old, making us uh, see it more clearly. Um, but yeah, these are some of the things that they believe, and this is some of the things that they try to uh, say in response to those. Uh, the, she the Shekinah explains are to mean God in addition to man and women, uh, such as uh, each human being is formed from three parents, a threefold parentage. Uh, and this is one of their rabbinical writings. Um, which I could not find the source for that one. Um, the threefold parentage being man, women, and God. This is the Jewish explanation to the plural noun usage. <clears throat> Their view of Jesus Christ, uh, Jesus as Mashiach or Messiah. Judaism states that the virgin birth is a myth and that Jesus Christ is a false prophet according to Deuteronomy 13.6, at which the Deuteronomy says, if your brother... The son of your mother, your son or your daughter, the wife of your bosom, or your friend who, ha who is as your own soul secretly entices you, saying, Let us go and serve other gods, which you have not known, neither you nor your fathers. And so they use that verse to say that Jesus Christ is a false prophet. Um, <clears throat> because, of course, they don't believe that when he's coming, saying he's of God, speaking for on behalf of God, or calling them out on their their misunderstandings of scriptures, that he's speaking of the one true God that they believe. They believe he's speaking of some other God. So Judaism teaches that the phrase, the son of your mother, is a veiled reference to Jesus Christ as an apostate that would lead Israel to other gods and claim to be born of a virgin without a human father. The context of the passage is addressing false prophets. Uh, the concept of the Messiah, the Jews. If Jesus is not the Jewish Messiah, um, then what is the Jewish concept of Moshiach, 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 something like that? Um, <clears throat> the general belief was that the sending of the Messiah was part of the Creator's plan at the inception of the universe. Seven things were created, as we talked about uh, the Torah, repentance, the Garden of Eden. Uh, Gehenna, the throne of glory, the temple, and the name of the Messiah. Uh, one, on one point, the rabbis were unanimous. Uh, Mashiach would be just a human being divinely appointed to carry out an allotted task. The Talmud nowhere indicated a belief in a superhuman deliverer as the Messiah. Uh, the prevailing belief was that the Messiah would be a descendant of the king, and a common des designation for him in rabbinic literature is the son of David. Uh, remember, however, the Talmud was written after the time of Christ and has the purpose to answer current circumstances. The Talmud had to address the division between Judaism and Christianity, uh, and the distinction was in the divine Messiah. Their view of sin, uh, pre-existence of man. Uh, Judaism teaches that God created all souls, souls of man on the same day with the angels. Uh, in the seventh heaven... Araboth, uh, are stored the spirits and souls which have still, be, still to be created, um, the unborn souls which have yet to be united to the bodies. Has anybody ever heard that before? I've heard of Mormonism. Yeah, Mormonism. Yeah. So Mormonism has free life birth, but it's different than that. In Mormonism, we were never created, but we were always existing in something that is logical. 
Yeah. Uh, not yeah, so, I mean, their belief, according uh, to this source, is that uh, all mankind was created at the same time, you know, and they're just waiting. Um, created with the angels. So the soul is the spiritual force within man which raises him above an animal's existence, inspires him with ideas, and prompts him to choose the good and reject the evil. Uh, since the spirit of man was created prior to the fall, it is good and not sinful. Evil impulse. They make God the author of sin. Uh, the Holy One, blessed be He, said to Israel, My children, I have created the evil impulse. And I have created the Torah as an antidote to it. Uh, if you occupy yourself with the Torah, you will not be delivered into its power. Um, when God created man, he was created good, but with an evil impulse. The Holy One, blessed be he, created two impulses, one good and the other evil. At the root of the discussion was the opinion that man is essentially a sinful creature who is bound during his lifetime to do many deeds which earn for him the condemnation of God, but, a, but of human nature uh, is the evil impulse which can be mastered, but all too often takes control and uh, demoralizes. Uh, the belief that in every human being there are two urges, one to, do, one to evil and the other to goodness, figures prominently in rabbinical ethnics. Uh, having to find a basis for the doctrine in the text of the Bible, the rabbis deduced it in this was what means that which is written then the lord god formed man uh, the wajitzer i think that's how you say that wajitzer uh, as he formed and he formed meaning that was the word for that and he formed uh, being sp spelt with two j's uh, this is kind of where they come up with this uh, two j's the holy one blessed be he created two impulses one good and the other evil uh, the hebrew word for impulse is jetzer Hence the two J's when then to indicate two, the Jetster Jatab, good impulse, and Jetster Hara, evil impulse. Uh, the evil impulse is 13 years older than the good impulse. I, I, first, when I was looking at that, I'm like, what? I don't, I don't understand that. I really, I really don't get it. Like, what, how do you come up with this? This is, you know, I don't, I don't understand how you come up with that. Uh, but the evil impulse is 13 years older than the good impulse. It exists from the time a person uh, is, is born. Uh, it grows with him and accompanies him through life. It begins to de uh, desecrate the Sabbath, uh, to kill and act immorally, uh, but there is nothing within him to prevent it. So until he's 13, he can't prevent these things. Uh, after 13 years old, after he turns 13, the good impulse is born. Um, when he desecrates the Sabbath, it warns him, uh, good for nothing, behold, it said, Everyone that profaneth it shall surely be put to death. Uh, what is the significance of the age of 13? Well, that's when we know that they do their bar mitzvah. Um, so that's, that was a new thing for me because I knew they do bar mitzvahs at 13, but I didn't know why. I didn't know that they believed that, you know, when you're born, you're born with this evil impulse, which 13 years older than you get the good impulse, you know. Do you know what, when this teaching originated? No, uh, I don't, uh, honestly. But these are the sources here are the, um, the Babylonian Talmud. You have, that's what the B-E-R for, 61. That was 549 B.C., I think. Yeah. So that, what I'm just, when, you're, when you're talking, it's interesting to me. It drives home when Jesus is saying uh, things like you teach as doctrines the uh, traditions of man. Mm -hmm. It lets you know because this stuff just has no basis whatsoever. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it gives you a good perspective of it when you're seeing it. Like you said, you know, the doctrines of men, because we think of things that they're just, they're applying. Because we, we know that when we look at the laws, we, we understand Israel had 613 laws, you know, in the, in the Old Testament, 613 to try to keep. And we know when we look in, in when we're reading the New Testament, the Pharisees, they impl uh, implemented laws on top of the laws to try to keep themselves from violating these laws. And so then these laws became the thing that you kept. And unfortunately, you know, the heart is what was never changed and was unclean. And so it's not the outside. They would make the outside appear. You know, they make big deal about the, the disciples eating something without washing their hands or, you know, doing certain things on the Sabbath. 
They made all these extra laws to try to protect themselves from these laws, but didn't realize they were still violating the laws of God. Um, so, but when you, you think about tradition in that way, but yeah, when you see some of these teachings that they have, it kind of puts a, an understanding on, wow, yeah, I can understand how their traditions then come in to play a part in, in so much. Yes? Um, this almost contradicts, well, this flat out contradicts scripture because, you know, the Bible says foolish, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child and, you know, a severe beating will, will drive it far from you. But what this is implying is you can't really correct a child, uh, you can't really train a child because right. from the age of zero to 13, they're just going to do what's wrong. Right. So why correct a child? It, it just doesn't make sense. Right. It's like, there you go, do whatever you want. Yeah. Yeah, because there's, you have no control of it until you turn 13. Then you get the impulse, the good impulse. Yeah. Yeah, it is contradictory. It is. Um, how, old was, how old was Josiah? Yeah. The, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. According to their own writings, that Josiah broke the lineage of his father and contradicted it and became a, a good king. Sought after yeah. God and ground all the idols in the land of Israel. Right. Us. At eight years old. Yep. But, you know, we can believe that when you look at this, this doesn't happen. No. This kind of stuff happens because they don't care. And they import their, their mm-hmm. methods, their uh, opinions mm-hmm. to the text of Scripture. Yeah. Which happens a lot. It happens in Christianity as well. I mean, we, we see it. People want to imply their interpretation. I know how many of us in here has heard. In a, been in a Sunday school class and say, what do you think that, that passage means? Have any of you ever heard of that? You know? And so then people start applying their interpretation or, or their thought of, well, I think this means this, but I think this means this. No, the context dictates what it means. The Word of God speaks to itself. Scripture interprets Scripture. Um, but, yeah, people have these different thoughts, these different ideas, and they stray away from that. And then these traditions become actually the authority rather than uh, the scriptures itself. <clears throat> uh, free will, their belief on free will. Judaism has the belief that all men have sinful impulse, not a sinful nature. Uh, and therefore, they have a free will. People are born morally neutral, uh, not desiring good or evil, which again contradicts the last slide, uh, the last thing that we just learned, because if up till 13, they have this evil impulse and they can't do nothing about it. Um, so again, they're committed. And that's something that you see. I mean, in Christianity, we have apparent contradictions, but they're not contradictions when you look them out and study them out. Uh, in many false religions and false beliefs and systems that they follow, they will have apparent contradictions that are actually contradictions. You know, because they don't have, because a contradiction would be something you don't have an explanation for. Uh, that's a legitimate explanation. Um, but here, I mean, again, just from the last slide that we've seen, the last teaching. Uh, So people are born morally neutral, not desiring good or evil. God does not decide if a man is righteous or wicked. It is wholly the will of a man. Uh, An oft-quoted maxim reads, All is in the hands of heaven except the fear of heaven, Uh, which means that although God decides the fate of the individual, a reservation is made with respect to the moral character of his life. It is the moral moral character that they, they base righteousness and wickedness on, and not the relationship with God, because all Jews believe that they are born into a relationship with God. Uh, The conviction that man's will is unfettered is seen to be the foundation of rabbinic ethnics. Uh, The nature of his life is molded by his desires. He can misuse life's opportunities if he so so wishes, uh, but in no circumstances would it be agreed that he must misuse them. The evil impulse constantly tempts him, but if he falls... The responsibility is his and his alone, yes. The good news is about Judaism, as you think of an apologetic, it's always true that the best defense for the Christian faith is a knowledge of the scriptures. Always. Yeah. All, a lot of times you get lost in these other things. This is this is easy peasy lemon squeezy. I mean if you're if you're hearing somebody talk about this stuff, who was Paul quoting when he was writing in Romans three that there are none good, no not one, that none seek for God? He was quoting Isaiah. So that's their prophet who's building off of that. Jeremiah 14 um, says that every man is stupid and without knowledge. 
these are all of their prophets. So if you know your Old Testament, which you need to, the idea that uh, that a lot of people have that you just need to know the, the, the New Testament, I would say honestly, if you don't understand the Old Testament, you don't understand the New Testament either. So I don't think you understand either one of those. But um, if you know your Old Testament really, really well, you don't even need to know necessarily, because every position is nuanced, right? Every Jewish person from one to the next and, and system, they're just like us. They're going to have different sects and stuff. Let them talk. Yeah. And then just this stuff ought to flow out of you. Right. If you know your scriptures. Well. Yeah. Yeah, that's why the most important thing, like we said in the introduction, the most important thing is we want to know the scriptures. You know, we, we and, and, and it's not going to be something that just comes overnight. So don't think you, you're going to be able to just cram it all in and you're going to know the entire Bible overnight. I mean, it takes years. A lot of times the, the problem, I think, when it comes to studying is we live in a nation where we get everything like that at, at the tip of our fingers. We just, oh, I need to know something, Google, right? Or get online and find the sources, and, and you've got the, the information right at your fingertips, the access to news and media and everything's right there. It's quick access. And so then when we come to the Word of God, we think, well, I want to know everything about the Word of God, and I want to know it now. It takes time to study. It takes time to read in the Word of God. And it, it, it's many, uh, nobody arrives, so you're always learning new things. A disciple is a learner. You're always learning, continuing to learn. But just be patient, and as you grow, you learn more things. You know what I mean? When you're reading and studying God's Word, yes. I was going to say, which, what, what is great here, and the resource that you have in the New Testament is, for example, the book of Hebrews. That is a Hebrew argument mm-hmm. to other Hebrews about the divinity of Christ and the triunity of God, you know? So you've got that, and if you were to go to Acts 16, and you go to the Gnostic-ish people at kind of the postmodern yeah. position, what did I say, Acts 16? Acts 17. Mm-hmm. Uh, you said 16. But I'm in Acts 17. But um, not only is the information that you need in there, nothing's new, so it's all just been recycled. So you can go to the authors right. of Scripture, and you can say, this is how, because they're all Hebrews. Right. This is how the Hebrews, used their own scriptures, which was the Old Testament at that time, and defended their position from that against the same kinds of people that are assaulted right now. Yeah. So. And it's the same thing uh, you preached on before uh, here and, and have talked about when it comes to Jesus after he rose from the, the grave on, on the road to Emmaus. I mean, he goes back and tells them all about him, and he, we didn't have New Testament at that time written. He went all from the Old Testament from beginning to end, talking all about the scriptures that dealt with him. You know, to point it out that this was speaking about me. Um, and so it's there. It's there in the Old Testament. Um, did we read that bottom part? Yeah, we did. Yeah, we did. All right, a curious explanation is given why the whole human race originated from one man uh, because of the righteous, the righteous and the wicked, uh, that the righteous should not say we are the descendants of the righteous ancestor. And that's from the Sanhedrin. Uh, <clears throat> the moral is that neither can plead hereditary influence as the deciding factor in their character. All right, their view of salvation, salvation from sin. Uh, salvation is through the Torah. Uh, this is the importance of the Torah for a Jew. A Jew has two issues to overcome, heritage, uh, being born a Jew, uh, and the belief that there is no sin nature in man, and therefore... Man can choose good on his own, or his or her own. Uh, Jews do not see themselves as sinners by nature. Uh, their tradition and heritage convinces them that they do not have a need for a savior. Uh, they believe they can master the evil impulse, and they can do that which pleases God through repentance. Do you have another question or thought? Okay, I thought you. No, sorry. All right. Um which is not much different than what we see in a lot of people today, even though they may say we need a Savior. Actually, today they'll say, well, yeah, I believe in Jesus. But, because think about it, how many of us have got into conversations with people and you ask them, well, what do you got to do to go to heaven? Well, you got to keep this, you got to do this, and you got to do this. Well, how do you do those things? You know, And, and, and you, you get to kind of see where people stand and what they believe um, just by asking them questions. And, and it's not much different even in our society of those who profess to be Christians, they think that you got to do things. Uh, with Jews, they believe they're born, as they said in you know a couple of slides ago, they believe they're born already with a relationship with God. I would agree. We all are born with a relationship with God. You know, huh? Not a good one. Yeah, not a good one. Um, 
So, salvation by repentance. Uh, in so, or in as much as God created man with the evil impulse by reason of which he is prone to sin, justice demanded that uh, an antidote uh, should likewise be provided for salvation. If wickedness is a disease to which the human being is susceptible, it was necessary for him to have a medium of healing uh, such as to be found in repentance. Why, however, was it necessary for the Torah to be given in this twofold form? Uh, an answer suggested to this question is the Holy One, blessed be He, gave Israel two Torahs, uh, the written and the oral. He gave them the written Torah in which <clears throat> are 613 commandments. <clears throat> Excuse me. In order to fill them with precepts whereby they could earn merit, he gave them oral oral Torah, uh, whereby they could be distinguished from the other nations. This was not given in written, in writing, so that the Ishmaelites should not fabricate it as they have done the written Torah and say that it that they were Israel, and that's Numbers fourteen ten. That's their commentary again on the numbers. Whenever you see the R. It's talking about their commentary on the numbers. <clears throat> Clearly, the Jew believes that living according to the Torah, 613 laws will earn them merit. Imagine that. I mean, living up to the 613 laws. I mean, we can't even... I mean, Jesus sums up the, the law in total when they ask him, what is the greatest of these laws and the greatest of these commandments? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and strength. Nobody can do that. So we already violated. You can't do it. Yeah. And that's in Baltimore. The same thing that you have in Catholicism, the same thing that you have in Mormonism, the same thing that they ultimately have in those witnesses. Every false system and belief that's sort of based in the Bible that doesn't really adhere to it develops some other multiple, some other stream of revelation, which is them. Mm -hmm. So they have. What they have allowed for themselves is an oral tradition that trumps the written tradition so that they can revise it as they see fit. Yeah. It's really, if it's the same thing, it's recycling itself over and over and over again. Yeah. And as you said, there's nothing new under the sun. As you said, they just, it's the same heresy, same false teaching, same whatever, just keeps being recycled. They'll throw a different name on it, or, and we just see the same things over and over again. <clears throat> Which is why we see some of the same styles that come back and forth in time. You know. See so styles from the 60s and stuff. People start wearing things. And just Everything recycles and they think it's, hey, it's new. No, it's not. Um, since as the Bible declares, God delights not in the death of the wicked, uh, but, that he turn, but that he turn from his evil way and live, uh, according to Ezekiel 33, 11, it follows that he is anxious for man to repent and facilitate his endeavor to do so. The rabbis declared that repentance was one of the seven things which were created before or by God uh, before the world was formed. <clears throat> uh, Gentile salvation, that would be the majority of us unless you have a Jewish background. Um, <clears throat> salvation for the Gentiles is through obedience to the Noahic covenant. <clears throat> Sorry about my throat today, guys. <clears throat> Uh, the eternal state, the world to come. <clears throat> Many incidental remarks occur in the Talmud during, uh, declaring that the person who performs a certain action will or will not have a share in the world to come. Uh, there is not a dogmatic verdict in the eternal fate of a person. Uh, the the many remarks are nothing more than a hyperbolic, hyperbolic expression of approval or disapproval. Uh, more importance is, however, attached to the extract. All Israel has a share in the world to come, uh, as it is forever. So they obviously they believe that they're all, they're all saved. They're all going to be because they are children of Abraham. They are uh, the descendants, and they are God's people. So they have this idea that they're all going to be in the world to come, in the eternal state. <clears throat> uh, Gehenna, uh, the fate of the wicked is to descend into a place of punishment called Gehenna or hell. Uh, its origin predates the creation of the universe. Uh, the principal safeguard, however, is the study of Torah. The fire of Gehenna has no power over the sinners in Israel. Uh, there is some debate between the rabbis on the subject of people being sent to Gehenna for eternity or just for a time or not at all. 
which is no different, again, from what we see in Christianity. Uh, we see people that want to argue the existence of hell. You know, the Bible's clear, hell is a real place, um, but there's even people who will say that you either get annihilated for a short time, you, you suffer annihilate, or, uh, the punishment, then you're annihilated completely, uh, or there's, there's nothing. You know, there's nothing out there. Um, <clears throat> but uh, we hold to the Word of God says that there is a place of hell, of torment for those who uh, die in their sins. <clears throat> so we're at the end here. So I just got some questions that, uh, eh, pretty good on time too, I guess. Um, got some questions here that were in the book just to kind of help you think about some things. Um, you don't have to respond, just kind of get you thinking about how you would answer these questions if this was something that would happen to come up. And hopefully, again, this, this you know, series will help you uh, understand a little bit more about what they believe. I know, like, like I said, not, we, we don't encounter, encounter too many Jewish people out there on the streets. I haven't. There's been a few, but I haven't encountered too many in sharing the gospel with people. So there were some things in here that I definitely did not know, you know. Um, <clears throat> But say, let's say a liberal Jew uh, that you work with states that you and he basically agree about religion except for the matter of Jesus being the Messiah. Is he right? How would you respond to that? Okay. A Jewish woman who you are witnessing to states that she is not a sinner and neither are you. How would you respond to that? Uh, when speaking with a Jewish man, he states that he does not need to repent for his sins because he is born a Jew. Therefore, he will enter the world to come. How would you respond to that? Uh, when discussing the Bible with your Jewish neighbor, he states that you do not have the whole revelation from God because you do not know nor follow the oral law. How can you answer his argument? And in a conversation, someone states that Jews do not believe in hell. Do you agree? So these are just some things, and hopefully you kind of got an understanding of where they were coming from and, and some of their teachings to kind of help you maybe address these things. And, that, and as we said, and Pastor said, ultimately, this is what we want to know, the Word of God. We want to study this. We want to learn from here. So that when we do have these questions, we, we want to listen to people because we don't want to misrepresent them. So it's better even if they come up and they say, well, I'm a Jew. You know, I'm Jewish. I'm, I'm from Israel. And maybe, you, maybe you've studied in that. Or maybe you come out of Mormonism or uh, Jehovah's Witness or, you know, some other religion. And you have a good understanding of what they believe. It's still better to let them talk first and explain when you ask them a question. Well, what do you believe about heaven or hell? What do you believe how someone's saved? Because then you're going to get their understanding and it's going to make it easier for you. I mean, obviously we want to know this, but it'll be, make it easier for you to use this than to address their belief. Because again, we understand there's different sects. Everybody, you know, even in here, there are people that may have some different understandings of certain things in scripture. Um, and so you want to understand where they're coming from first to then be able to relate to them and be able to, to speak to that.